was uh, of all the amazing things uh, that I got to be a part of this last week, part of We Week, and uh, thrilled to get to hang out with so many of you and serve alongside you in the amazing things, watching what God is doing. Uh, there, there was a moment on a Thursday that I was uh, scheduled to have coffee with a gentleman, and I uh, sat down and he arrived, and he had uh, brought six people with him. It was a little... Okay. And uh, they're from the Winter Haven Church of God. And they had read the article in the paper about this community and what God was doing here. And his question was, how can we get to happen there what is happening here? And so we spent an hour together talking about what it looks like to be a church for the done doubting and disengaged what it looks like to be a church that is committed to seeing calling activated in individual people's lives, the things, preferences that would have to be laid down in order to watch God move. And I, I share that with you because that is, that it happened Thursday, so it's fresh in my memory. It happens often. I want you to know the impact that you are making far beyond anything that you will ever get the privilege to see. The way in which you're transforming lives that you don't even know. And at the end of the day, uh, it is amazing how complicated we make faith and we make church. Can I just, can I just make it real easy for you? Because my guess is that you probably walk in with some burden, heartache, hardship on your life. Ready? You, you can leave after this. I'm still gonna preach. I don't want you to leave, but you can leave because this might be all you need. Obey God. Oh, you want more? That's it. If you follow God in the midst of what is difficult and hard and confusing, you can trust him with every last outcome and he is faithful and he is good and he is trustworthy, and he is worthy to be praised. So come on, let's give him our praise this morning. Church for the one. All glory, all honor, amen. I'd like to read a passage over you today. Uh, I know you sat down last week if you were here. That's not happening today, and I'm making up for it. We're gonna add all the verses I would have read last week to the standing of this week and we'll be perfectly okay with it, right? <laughs> I apologize for the weird tone to start the message. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 12. And it gets a little weird as we go through it, but I love how Paul writes this. He says, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. I believe if he would write that today, he would say, whether young or old, no matter what background you are from, that we were all given one spirit so as to form one body and one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, Weird phrase, because feet can't speak. Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. And I feel like it's at this point in time that we get the metaphor, right? Like you're good, he keeps going. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Can we live this out in this moment, wherever you are here, North Lakeland, online? Just turn to the person next to you and say, I don't need you. You are going against the very, whoa. 
what else was said? <laughs> I don't need you. That carried on for a while. I just want to acknowledge <laughs> in some circles. He goes, no, you need each other. He says, in the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. Can I, can I just talk about that for a second and it not be part of the message? Um, I am really grateful to get to serve as your pastor. And I don't know what group at one point in time decided that October was Pastor Appreciation Month. It's not in the Bible. I feel like it's one of those like Hallmark Sweetest Day things. I feel uncomfortable. I hear this only is gratitude, okay? Only is gratitude. But it gives this part of the presentable parts need no special treatment. I am one of the presentable parts. I am not saying I am very presentable. <laughs> I'm saying per this, I am one of the presentable parts of this body of believers. And, uh, and I just get uncomfortable sometimes in these moments because my desire deep within me is to deflect as much attention as I can away from that because I believe it's not the gifting of any one or few individuals that makes the church what it is. It is all of us together as a body. He says, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Can we give thanks for God's word for us today? Amen. Let's pray in this moment. Heavenly Father, over every individual, over every heart, over every soul, I pray that your will would be done today. Father, I lift up the Winter Haven Church of God that what you're already stirring in their spirits and souls would turn into action and conviction, that something would take place there that could only be attributed to you. And Father, we pray nothing less than your very best over our hearts and minds and souls today, that we would come to know you at a deeper level than we could have ever fathomed and that our calling would be made clear as our salvation is rejoiced in. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen and amen. Church, wherever you are, high five your favorite people around you. Come on, let them know. If you said, I don't need you, make up for it right now in this moment. Title of the message for today is I want to talk to you about motives and models. Motives and models. And I want to start by talking about mental models. Mental models is how you think about the thing that you're doing. It is, if I just give you the easiest definition, mental models are symbols that aid understanding. And I believe that mental models are actually pivotal to transformation, even though it might be the last thing that we think of. I, I stumbled on this a number of years ago. I was uh, guiding a group of pastors on how to preach, and I was helping kind of train and equip them, and all of these were already preaching regularly. And I just paused in a moment, and I said, oh, as you're, as you're prepping a sermon, what are you thinking about? Like, what are you thinking that you're doing as you're prepping a sermon. And uh, one of the guys in my group, he said, I'm digging for gold. That's what I'm doing as I'm reading the text, as I'm going through the Bible, I'm digging for gold. And I, uh, I just wanna be clear, I said this nicer when I spoke to him, but I was just like, oh, that's so obvious that that's what you're thinking you're doing. Because when I listen to your message, it's like 15, million, 15 minutes of just like horrifically boring. And then like one thing that's interesting. 
and then like another 15 minutes of horrifically boring. Because like, I was just like, you don't have to take them the whole way through the dig. You can just show them the gold. Because <laughs> digging is really boring. Can we acknowledge that? <laughs> He's going, there, there. And, uh, can, I share, can I share my mental model with you yeah. on how I preach? Yeah. It's, it's a little weird and you're going to judge me. <laughs> cool? Yeah. This is like, it, I, I kind of view it like this. Like there is something in the text that is alive. Like scripture says this, the, the, the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. And so I just kind of view it. I go like, there's this thing in the text that is alive. And if I could just get a hold of it. Now, here's the thing that I think of, and I don't know why this is what I think of, but I think the thing is, so I use an animal that I need to get a hold of. And I don't know why my head went here originally, but I think of a dragon. I know. That's really dumb. And you're like, why are you? And yes, I know that dragons in the Bible are bad. But, but in my head, this one's a good dragon. And, uh, and I call him Puff. And we just, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. These are just jokes. <laughs> but I walk through and I go like, if I can just get a hold of it, I can figure out where it wants to go. That the ideas and the truth in the text they already have natural implications. They're already moving somewhere. I just need to be able to understand it so I can get a hold of it so I can see where it'll go. And I hope this makes sense a little bit more as to how I do what I do. Because you'll be listening one day and you'll be like, well, we were here. And in my head, I'm going, oh, this is it. And then I can go, oh, and it's here. And it's here. And it's also like this in our lives. And this is how God moves it in this space. Does that make sense? Are we tracking a little bit? Mental models. I, I want to talk to you about some of your mental models so we're on the same page. Let's talk, let's talk parenting mental models first. Woo! Let's have some fun with some parenting mental models. The two most common mental models that I've heard recently is it refrains, refers to parenting. Uh, the first one is that of a lawnmower. Anyone familiar with the parenting mental model of lawnmower? No one is familiar with the lawnmower parenting mental model? Oh, well, some of you do it. Oh, you don't even know what it is. That's why this is an offensive to you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain it, and then I'm going to say some of you do it again, and then we'll have more of a reaction. The lawnmower parenting is the parent who thinks their kid is ill-equipped for any difficulty or hardship in front of them, and so instead of allowing their child to enter the difficult moments in life, they clear a path for them so that they have smooth sailing all along the way. One of the recent studies found that of recent college graduates in their first real job interview, 30% of them take their mom with them to the first interview. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand, but you have been sufficiently called out in this moment. See, the problem with the lawnmower parenting mental model is some of you do it. Oh, there we go. Now that clicked. Lawnmower parenting. Another, maybe this is one's a little more familiar. Have you heard of helicopter parenting? There we go. Now we're on the same page. And you go, well, this one, it's the hover. I just have to be, I just have to watch it, make sure nothing, I'm good at all times. I have watched helicopter parents on the playgrounds with kids. I do not have the energy. That's not criticism, that's apathy, okay? I do not have the energy to do the helicopter parenting. If I give you my, uh, when my kids were younger, um, the, the mental model that I used, like when they were like toddler age, it was like to describe my symbol that aided understanding for what I was doing. I, I view myself, um, have, have you ever gone bumper bowling? Like four of us have gone, have you ever gone bumper bowling? Can I just be an advocate first for bumper bowling? It's so much better than regular bowling. And some of you are like, no, it's like child stuff. Listen, you don't need that kind of negativity in your life where you're doing this hobby that's meant to be enjoyable and you're thrown in the gutter every third frame. Ah, pull the bumpers out. Bowl 150, feel fantastic about yourself. It's so much better that way. Bumper bowling. 
And so I was like, I was like, when my kids were toddlers, I was like, I am the bumpers. Like I am just keeping them somewhat near where they should be and alive. That's my job. That was my bar. If Bethany would leave the house for the evening and she came home and when she left, there were four kids. And when she came home, there were still four kids who were breathing. I won. I don't care if they ate. I don't care if they were clean. I don't care if they needed to be bathed. If they were alive, I claimed victory. Bumpers. That's not the mental model I use now. Uh, the mental model I use to guide what I'm doing in this season is nutrition. That I am nutrition for my children. I am the supplement that they need in the circumstance and situation that they're in. And, and so I view it as if you're in the spot, I'm not trying to change the context around them. I'm trying to change them in the context. If they need tools, I can give them tools. If they need coaching, I can give them coaching. If they need confidence, I can be their source of confidence. If they need courage, I can instill in them courage. It is not what I'm doing around them or hovering over them. It is what I'm putting in them during this season that matters most. Does this make sense? Healthy mental models. Let's talk marriage, mental models. Sometimes I ask couples, what do they think they're doing on there? I don't say it like that. I don't go, what do you think you're doing? Is they like, hey, in your relationship, you got like jobs, you got kids, you got all this other stuff. And, and one of the things I'll hear back is people say like, we're just trying to grow together. We're just trying to grow together. And, and I get this image in my head of these like parallel lines. We're just trying to grow together. Here's a problem with that. I don't think it's a bad mental model. It's just really easy to grow apart if that's how you view what you're doing. Like if we just can say like in my marriage where I'm, I'm growing and they're growing, but what happens if they start growing that direction and you start growing this direction and then 10 years down the line, you're miles apart and you both were growing, you just don't really know how you got there. And so I use a different mental model for marriage. My mental model is it's actually biblical. It is a cord of three strands. It is a life that is, watch what I'm gonna do. Look at that. You think I can just preach. <laughs> it is the intertwined life. Intertwined. That's different than growing together. It is seeing how enmeshed we can make our lives. It comes from the book of Ecclesiastes, which is like, the second most famous passage in scripture read at weddings. And I just said, like the book of Ecclesiastes, it's just like, if one falls, who is there to help them up? And then it says like, if one lies alone, who will keep them warm? But if two lie together, they can keep each other warm. Which I'm just like, I just need you to know, like 12 year old me at a wedding, my maturity level was not enough to be able to handle that passage. <laughs> Let's be honest. 40 year old me, my maturity is not enough to handle that. A passage like, if one lie, but two can keep each other warm. <laughs> and then it, and then it gives the next line. And I'm like, I've had so many times like the, but a cord of three strands is not easily broken. And I was always thinking, and I'm like, wait, where'd the third strand come from? whose mom has been helicoptering for all these years that is gonna swoop in at the last minute. Was that too much for some of you on there? You're like, Ugh. <laughs> Because the third strand is meant to be God. And so the idea is, is to say, not just how can we grow together, but how can we enmesh our lives with each other and God in what he's doing so that even if we're going one direction, we better be going the same direction that God's going. And that is how we enmesh our lives. So like if I talk to young couples on what their life looks like, I just always go, you need three practices over and over again. You need to pray together. You need to bank together. And you need to sleep together. 
You need to pray together so it's not just your agenda and your path, but so that you're enmeshing your agenda, intertwining your agenda with God's as much as you possibly can so that you're growing with him in all things. You need to bank together. Oh, this gets fun. Because people are getting married later in life. And so instead of just moving from their parents' checking account to a joint checking account, now they have already established financial stability on their own. And so then when the people get married, it's just like, well, do you want to have a joint checking account? And that gets all kinds of awkward. But the problem is scripture says that for where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And so if you're saying, I want to sleep with you, but I don't want to bank with you, you're saying I'm keeping a piece of my heart out on my own because I don't trust you with that part of it. Woo! We having fun today. I haven't even gotten to the passage. And you need to sleep together. We can. <laughs> We've said enough already. <laughs> Healthy mental models. Does this make sense? When Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that the church is a body, he is not saying the church is literally a body. He is giving us a symbol to aid our understanding in what the church was meant to be. Does this make sense? Sometimes we look at this like he says, it's a body. Let's look at just some of these lines right here. So he starts at the very beginning, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 of this section. He says, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. And he's trying to counteract that there's going to be a tendency to view church as simply something that I enjoy. Or there's going to be a tendency to view church as something that I consume or something that I'm a member of or something that's meant to aid my preferences. And he goes, no, it's a body. It's a body. This is what we're meant to think of when we think of church. We're meant to think of a body. Sometimes, and I just want you to know, uh, when people come in from a, from a different church and a different background, I am also grateful for you and the contribution you make to the vision and what God is doing in your life. But I always have a few questions. Is that okay for me to say? I know this is different than most churches because most churches are like, we're thrilled to have any warm body that's here. When someone's like, hey, we're, we're going to come to your church, I always want to be like, okay, tell me why. And if it's like, if it's like God is leading, doing this, something here, vision, calling, I'm like, let's go. If it's like, I've got someone in my life who doesn't know God, and this is the place in which they're starting connect, I'm like, absolutely, let's run with it. But when someone's like, well, I like I like how the lights look in your church more than the other church. I was like, I'm get, this is going to be really weird, okay? I've, I've prepped you. This is good. I, feel, I feel like when you're telling your friend and they're like, I have a weird dream. Did you ever tell them? Like, I had a really weird dream. And then the friend just stares back at you like this. Do you feel encouraged to share the dream? Okay, let's operate that way together. Could we do that? This is going to be a little weird. Oh, thank you. Like, when someone says, like, oh, I like your church because I like how the lights look versus my church, it's like, ah, now, if I use that, that's too weird, and people will leave. Let's bring it back a little bit. That's like saying, I really like your eyes. I would like your eyes. <laughs> you get it. That's what I think. I just want you to know, as we are having these conversations, that is what is going through in my head. I take it like horror film way too fast on there. Because embedded in my understanding of what the church is, is the church is a body. Not a show, not an event. It is a body at the core. Does this make sense? 
are we tracking? When, when Paul is walking us through what is taking place in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he is helping us understand you are misreading what church is, and if you have the wrong metaphor, if you have the wrong symbol, if you are using the wrong mental model, you will make wrong implications on what you're supposed to do. It is dangerous to use the wrong mental model. If right now for my kids, I am nutrition. When they are adults, that is not my role. If I try to operate with adult children with bumper bowling mentality or even nutrition mentality, I'm gonna be in a bad spot. Does this make sense? Are we tracking? So one of the mental models we have used this past year when it comes to the way in which we minister to those around us is the mental model of running a race. And I, honestly, in a lot of ways, I like this mental model. It's biblical. Like there's a lot of running the race in scripture, run the race set out before us, run with perseverance the race that God has set out for us. Here's the problem is we were talking with some people on our team and other spots over the last couple months, and there's parts of this mental model that has just been unhealthy. And part of the response is people are going like, I'm just tired of running. It's like, well, that, that makes sense. Just the idea of running makes me tired. I don't like it. And, and the problem with the idea of using this language, which was, I believe, helpful for a season that we've said this last year is about run for the one, is when you run, there is only one winner. But that's not what church is. And that's not what ministry is. And so we are choosing to abandon that mental model and to shift to maybe a less like, it doesn't sound as cool, but I think a healthier mental model of farming. Much praise. Because in farming, thank you very much for that. In farming, the responsibility, there's still, there's still hard work but there's not hurry. Like when you're running, your heart rate better be up. When you're farming, you have to start early and go late, but there is intentionality, but not hurry to your pace. When you farm, your responsibility is to continuously cultivate. If something isn't growing, you don't tell it to work harder. When something isn't growing, you give it what it needs in order for it to grow. My favorite part of this is in races, one person wins, but farms get passed on to multiple generations. That's what we're trying to do here. Is I, I want you to know you're going to hear us talk a lot less about the race that we're running and a lot more about what we need to cultivate. As we make these shifts in thought patterns, this is what I believe that Paul was actually after in uh, Romans 12 where he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so often in renewing of our mind, we often think that that's just about truth versus lies. It's not just truth versus lies. It's the thoughts that we think as we are transformed. If you're married in your parallel lines, eventually you will grow apart. You are meant to be intertwined in everything that you're doing. As a parent, if you are trying to take care of everything that is going on in your kid's life, the reality is you will position yourself as their savior and they will not be able to see their own savior because your thinking patterns are off. Part of being transformed is changing the thoughts that we think as we do all the things that we do. We good? Cool. Now, let's talk about motives, models, and motives. As your context changes, if your motive is going to stay the same, your model must change as well. Whenever uh, Bethany was pregnant with our third kid, she's about eight and a half months pregnant, 
And she comes home one day with alarm and says, your car doesn't fit three car seats in the back. To which I was like, cool. I mean, I was fine with it. I was driving an illustrious Hyundai Elantra at the time. Two days later, I had a new car. I didn't pick it out. I didn't buy it. She went through all of that for me. It was nesting at its finest. If, if my motive for my family to be together, quite literally, physically, as we go from place to place, was going to remain the same, I had to shift the model. As my context changed, if my motive was going to remain, my model had to change. Tracking? Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 about the mental model we should use for church. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is followed by 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the chapter on love, the most common read passage at weddings. Here's what is hilarious to me, is that people think 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is about marriage. Paul has written a scathing letter to the church in Corinth. For 11 chapters, he has torn them apart. At chapter 12, he begins to rebuild their understanding through a new mental model that the church is a body. And most people think, and then he got to chapter 13 and he became a poet. He's like, pause, and he's like, all right, guys, I've been working on this thing. I think it's going to be a big hit at weddings. Anybody want to sit and read my chapter on love? It's not about marriage. It's about ministry. If your marriage is not about being served, but serving, then it applies to your marriage. But if it's not, it has nothing to do with marriage. If we could, if we could jump down to verse 4 in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If we could skip the intro on there, I'm, I'm going to kind of read it, but I wish, like, I, I wish we could hear it and what he's actually telling us. So I want you to picture right here, as if we're at a wedding and I'm doing the ceremony and we've got the bride and the groom and everything is beautiful and wonderful. And let's imagine what Paul is actually telling the couple in this moment. And so we start, be patient. You love each other? Be patient. Be kind, don't be jealous jerks, don't boast about doing the dishes, even if you're the one who always does the dishes. Don't be a narcissist in your marriage. Don't dishonor other people. Don't go after yourself. Don't be angry with other people. Don't keep any record of wrongs, even if you are the person who always does the dishes. Are we, are we grasping a little more what it's like? First Corinthians chapter 13. I just want to encourage any young couples who are maybe engaged, maybe have my version of First Corinthians chapter 13 read at your wedding. And let's see how that goes. See, what, what Paul is doing in this account is he is helping us understand the model that you use matters. And as your context shifts, if your motive is going to stay the same, then the model must shift as well. Everybody good? Now we can talk about all the stuff I really want to talk about. For the last 60 years, Christianity has existed in three distinct worlds in the United States. The positive world, the neutral world, and the negative world. The positive world, if we date it back to the 1960s, is when Christians were known by a moral majority. It was elect Christians with Christian Orthodox views into positions of political power and utilize our voting block and our spending habits to enforce our morality on the rest of the world. The thing that gets associated with faith in the positive world, this is the view of Christianity is generally positive. It is beneficial in society to be known as a believer, as a follower of Jesus. It was difficult to get elected if you weren't a Christian. It was a big deal when John F. Kennedy got elected president because he was the first Catholic to be elected president. We would think nothing of that today. 
it was a big deal back then because what is known in the positive world is power. Around 1995 to somewhere around 2000, that sentiment and emotion behind it began to change. And it wasn't that Christianity wasn't viewed positively, it was neutral. It was just there. The words that get associated with the neutral world that Christianity exists in is attention and goodwill. This is when pop culture started coming into the church. Music started changing, graphics started changing. The role of the church in the neutral world becomes to garner attention. The risk in the neutral world is to be forgettable. It wasn't that people disliked church, it's that they forgot. And so the thought of church leaders was if we can do something interesting, compelling, that people want to be a part of, then they will have faith. Somewhere around 2019 is when the negative world began invading our culture. And there's glimpses of it before then. And this is really important. There are pockets of the neutral world that still exists today. And so it is easy when I make these broad-based generalizations to go, well, that's not really true of where I am. And I believe you wholeheartedly but I would argue that you exist in an echo chamber, not in the reality of the whole. In the negative world, Christianity is viewed skeptically. Can I, can I show you some key differences? You can go ahead and put my last words up there for negative world. If you were to invite someone to say, you need to go to church, in the neutral world, their response would be, I know. And the response was, come to my church. Jesus will make your life better. And all of the teaching was how Jesus will make your marriage better, your relationships better, your finances better, and your joy better. We tracking? If you were to ask someone in the negative world, say, you should go to church, their response would be, why? And the gospel of Jesus makes your life better does not gain traction. And it's replaced with a new ancient message. Jesus is Lord. Here's what I need to explain to you. And then I'm going to hopefully pause long enough to give you a glimpse. I need you to know where we're headed and I need you to know the path we've already been on that I did not have language for until recently. After uh, the 9 a.m. service today, I had many people come up to me and they said, I've known that was happening, I just couldn't describe it. And I have echoed that. I knew it was happening too, I just didn't know how to describe it. If you're gonna do church effectively, do you, first off, could we just have some fun with this? Could you go wider? I'm a shot. I need a better hand motion when I need the wide shot other than. <laughs> Do you remember when the church changed in the 90s? And all of a sudden, instead of choirs and organs, we had bands. Like, you remember that? You remember how much weeping and gnashing of teeth there were in many churches for those of us who were alive in those moments? See, I need you to see the church is shifting again, but it's not shifting in terms of its style. It's, chi it's shifting in terms of its substance. And here's my, here's the thing I need you to understand is if you exist in the neutral world, church as a cruise ship is actually really effective. But if you take a cruise ship into a war zone, there is no way people survive. And for years and now decades, we have existed in this sentiment of we need to make church cool and we need to make church easy. And it was always followed by this is the message of Jesus. And if you will, this is typically what was said. If you will be in worship, 
be active in some ministry, be it a group or serving, and give financially, you are doing everything that God has called you to do. And then when circumstances changed and life got difficult and all of a sudden there was no longer wholehearted acceptance over the views that have been known as Orthodox Christianity for the last 2,000 years, when all of a sudden those shift, faith fades away quickly. You already see evidence of this in who we are. Our, uh, when we've used stuff to market for North Lakeland. We just stumbled across this line of church doesn't work. This evidence of the negative world. Purple, this last year, has been evidence of the negative world. We say we are a battleship. Evidence of the negative world. The thing that must be elevated in the negative world is the clarity of belief and the conviction of those beliefs. Some, some of you are asking, all right, you're going through all this, so, so if I come next week, what's different? Probably nothing, <laughs> because this is the path that we've already been on. But this is what I need you to see. And I'm not, man, I always get nervous about pastors who start just like proclaiming the worst as like doomsday fear-based messages. Now, I, I hope this doesn't sound like that at all. I don't think that followers of Jesus are gonna enter a time of persecution in my lifetime, but we could. Can we just say that? We could. If you go, no, we couldn't. Just read your Bible. It's happened a lot. <laughs> and if all you were ever taught and instructed in was a socially acceptable form of faith that is actually more secular than it is Jesus, your faith doesn't have a chance. And if I enter decades later and 80% of you fall away because I didn't prep you during this time, Oh, man, I will regret what I do during these days. I will regret it. And I refuse to live in that. So I, I just need you to know some pieces that are developing and some pieces that are already here. Uh, I am going to, with renewed focus, speak clearly on contested issues of today, not giving my opinion, but stating clearly where the Bible stands on some issues that somehow have gotten complicated in our culture. My desire in all of this is not simply, and again, I, I know this is hard. I know this is like the worst entry. If you're here first time, you're like, what is going on here? I thought church was easy. I believe that Jesus has this incredibly accessible message that invites everyone in. But if I tell you that the calling of God on your life is attend worship, get involved, and give financially, do you realize I am forcing you to miss what will be the greatest joy of your life because you never knew to look for something bigger? I was, uh, this last week, some people were sharing stories of what was going on. I shared the story of uh, Elliot. Elliot sang right there last week. Elliot usually worships right up there during the 9 a.m. <laughs> Is it that uh, Elliot was online during Prime Day and saw that these Bibles were for sale. And so he bought stacks of Bibles to hand out to homeless people. Now, can I just, like, if you're feeling convicted, me too. I got new charger cords because I was tired of my kids stealing mine. That's what I bought on Prime Day. <laughs> Elliot bought stacks of Bibles to hand out to people. He said that he, he got the stacks of Bibles, and then, um, and then he wanted to go to Walmart because he felt led that he was supposed to buy long-sleeve shirts 
for people to hand out with the Bibles. This is, a, it wasn't the first, it's like the second Prime Day. I want to make sure I'm dating this. I don't know how Prime Day happened twice. Whatever, that's another thing for another day. And so he went to Walmart and he said he was buying all these long sleeve shirts to hand out to homeless people with the Bibles. And he said, as I was checking out the family behind me, their card got declined. He said, I felt this nudge to pay for their groceries, but I just kept walking <laughs> because I got almost out the store and I just knew clearly I was supposed to go back. And so I went back and I paid for their groceries and they were so grateful. He goes, and then I was driving home and there was a man standing on a street corner with no shirt shivering. He said, I felt like God had prepared everything for that moment that I already had what I needed to give him because I had listened to how he had led me. And this is what happens when stuff like that happens. Elliot doesn't need my faith for his to take hold because his faith is not in me because he knows God leads. His faith is in him. I need you to know this is what I want for you. And somehow I think we got our language off and I apologize for this. Then when we said activated faith, people heard serve on a team. That is not what I am after. I am after your ruthless pursuit of Jesus that his kingdom would be manifest in your life. And here's the beauty of all of this. And I'm just going to be real blunt with you. The church sucks when it holds power because we were called to take up our cross. When the world is against us is when we are at our very best because we already know what it looks like to love every person around us. I'm excited about the season we're entering into because I now have language to describe the things that I've been sensing and feeling. As the world changes, as the context shifts, if our motives are gonna stay the same, the model has to shift as well. If we wanna keep it the same, it's fine. But let's not tell ourselves we're motivated by love when we're really just motivated by preference. But if we wanna love God and those he's called us to, then we must step into the next thing he's leading us into. I invite you to stand in this moment. Caleb and Chantel are gonna lead us in this next piece is going to be a little different. My fear is sometimes when you stand that you mentally check out. They're going to lead us in a simple chorus. If you could put on the back screen the words to the chorus because I want people to be able to see it. The song is Tend. And it is this plea to God and it says, So be the gardener of my heart. Tend the soil of my soul. Break up the fallow ground. Cut back the overgrown. I just want those two lines right there. Break up the fallow ground. What in your beliefs and behaviors needs broken up? Cut back the overgrown. What needs tended to in your life forgot to use you. As we're singing, I want you to offer your heart and your soul to your Savior that he would use you in mighty ways.